Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, International Conference of Celebrity and Crisis, Celebrity in Crisis. I'm very happy to give uh, our welcome. I am Roy Menarini, and I am the co-director of this conference together with Antonella Mascio, Sara Pesce, and the collaboration of Ilenia Caputo. Uh, today we are hosting this international uh, that was uh, supposed to be uh, in presence, but uh, due to the pandemic crisis, we were forced to um, organize this conference in streaming. But at the same time, now we can reach all the academic community all over the world, and we can host also all the speakers and papers uh, coming from all over the international um, community uh, of the uh, international university. So we are very happy to kickstart this conference. And uh, uh, first of all, I want to uh, recall that our conference is uh, uh, organized by the University of Bologna and the Department for the Life Quality Studies, Department of the Arts, uh, Department of Political and Social Sciences, together with uh, the uh, INC, International Research Network in Celebrity Culture, uh, CFC, Culture, Fashion, Communication, International Research Center, and Comedias, Communication, Media, and Public uh, Space. Uh, we are really looking forward to hear and to listen all the uh, papers uh, for the next uh, three days, but uh, for uh, um, introducing uh, our, uh, our program, I want to uh, invite uh, three uh, important heads of department for the institutional greetings, uh, starting with uh, Professor Filippo Andreatta, head of the Department of Political and Social Sciences, um, followed by Professor Giacomo Manzoli, head of the Department of the Arts, and last but not least, Professor Federica Muttarelli, deputy head of the Department for Life Quality Studies. So, um, I invite Filippo and I give the floor to him. Yes, just a minute to uh, give you my greetings and uh, to wish you to have a nice conference. It's a very interesting topic uh, in, uh, in a very dense program. So uh, the, my greeting will be very short. Uh, let me just uh, thank the organizers and uh, who have put together this program and also have uh, taken the most out of the situation and, and uh, transformed it in an online uh, event, which of course is uh, colder than, than uh, an event in presence, but gives the opportunity for many people outside Italy to, uh, to participate. Let's say that uh, we hope next year perhaps to have another conference and to be able to invite you uh, to, to the University of Bologna. I also would like to thank the other two departments. Uh, we collaborate often together, especially with the Department of the Arts, but also with uh, the uh, Department for the Quality of Life, which is in Rimini. And, uh, and uh, this means that it is both Bologna and Rimini joining together to organize this conference on a topic which is characteristically multidisciplinary and therefore requires uh, expertise coming from the, the three different departments. So without further ado, I uh, thank you and I, I greet you on behalf of the uh, Department of Political and Social Science and I leave the floor to Giacomo. Thank, thank you, Filippo. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure on behalf of me and my colleagues of the Department of the Arts to take part in this important international conference together with the other two departments. Um, an international conference dedicated to celebrity in crisis, celebrity in crisis, uh, and I'm really grateful to Antonella Mascia, Roy Menarini, and Sara Pesce for organizing this edition of the now traditional annual event that points out the, the, the fast development and change of such a subtle and delicate apparatus like stardom and celebrity in many different fields of uh, 
the public sphere where boundaries are increasingly vanishing. Uh, um, in fact, uh, I think that cinema, television, social media, politics, uh, and so on, are fields that uh, intertwine in many different directions, uh, creating a flow of impressive storytelling with images, uh, words, concise expressions, which vehiculate meanings and ideologies in ways uh, that is extremely difficult to construct and analyze. Uh, I just have to thank Antonella, Rory, and Sara and the many prestigious scholars who are going to speak in the next three days, uh, starting from today's keynote, Cornell Sandvoss, um, because I'm sure they will be helpful, helpful in order to better understand what we call the, the present world. Um, anyway, I, I don't want to take time anymore, just express uh, the wish, uh, uh, as Filippo said, that next year we will Bologna to stress the topic of celebrity in a much more, how can I say, human frame. Uh, so thank you very much and have a nice conference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Giacomo and Filippo. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today to greet you. Uh, I also greet you in the name of uh, Professor uh, Claudio Stefanelli, who is uh, the director of the Department of Life Quality Studies. But I greet you above all on behalf of the members of the research group uh, CFC, uh, which uh, means uh, culture, fashion, communication, um, which is expression of uh, the professors and the young researchers uh, belonging to the area of fashion studies here in Rimini, not here, but in Rimini campus uh, uh, for the University of Bologna. And some of them, some professors and some young researchers will participate uh, uh, with you in the work of this conference. So thanks uh, to uh, Antonella Mascio, uh, to Professor Antonella Mascio, Professor Sara Pesce and Professor Raimenarini, who in this very difficult period uh, and in very strange month have worked to organize a conference on such an interesting topic. A topic, this one uh, on the celebrities in crisis, which corresponds uh, perfectly to our way of studying and teaching both in Bologna and uh, in Rimini, uh, a way which uh, contemporaneity, media and visual phenomena are the object of our multidisciplinary scientific research uh, aim to uh, providing new tools, uh, new visions uh, on our world. And uh, as Filippo Andreatta and Giacomo Manzoli say, we hope to see you here in Bologna again very, very soon. So thanks again to all the guests and all the speakers. We are very happy to hear from you and uh, wish you good work. Uh, thank you. Ok, thank you. Uh, chiedo alla regia di inserire intanto le slide. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, we are very happy to be with you here today, also if online. Uh, I go now to start with a very short introduction to this conference. The conference stems from an idea and from an acknowledgement. Our idea regards the need to investigate celebrities' role in a period of crisis, but also their contribution to the definition of crisis, considering especially the precise circumstances of the pandemic that all of us are experiencing, and considering that this theme has not been addressed systematically by the scientific community, although Ilan Kapoor's book has already engaged the theme of celebrity humanitarianism, entitled Celebrity Humanitarianism 
the ideology of global charity, and a few articles have appeared on the journal Celebrity Studies. Our acknowledgement concerns the lack of large recognition of celebrity studies in Italy. A developed field of research in the international arena, in, in Italy, celebrity studies haven't established on an autonomous ground yet. For this reason, in the last five to seven years, with a number of colleagues of other universities, we have started to work on the visibility of what we consider a rich and interesting field. As a matter of fact, celebrity studies intersect a number of disciplines and theoretical approaches, conflating the political circumstances, the social context, and the conditionings and machineries of the show business world. We may give the example of Fedet's political stance in his discourse for May the first national event in Italy. Celebrity studies connect tradition and innovation as they regard past and present phenomena. They allow a privileged viewpoint on how our society is changing. According to Graham Turner, the one aspect that is truly remarkable of celebrity is how it has integrated the cultural processes of our daily life. Nobody, David Marshall remarks, is safe from the cultural and economic logic of celebrity culture. Richard Dyer underlines how celebrities colonize values and types in the ordinary discourse. But what does ordinary discourse actually mean? And how much does this discourse change in relation to the historical period that we are currently experiencing? What responsibility do celebrities have in all of this? And what is the role of the media? If we consider the current media environment, we notice that celebrities have the power of creating new forms of participation and community. They agglomerate audience groups and allow new systems of interactions between real and imaginary. If we consider contemporary issues like the current climate change, the pandemic or the minorities' rights, in many cases, celebrities appear involved personally and engaged on the front line. On the other hand, engaging global teams continuously is a process that produces notoriety and creates celebrities, as is the case of Greta Thunberg. Moreover, niche celebrities or micro celebrities have also appeared and obtained large recognition. They have activated new criteria of visibility and new languages. In the sphere of social networks, this form of celebrity culture demands a kind of analysis that puts to the foreground media practice and media use allowing an illusory access to famous people's backstage, producing a sense of intimacy between participant and follower. As Dana Boyd and Alice Marwick have remarked. According to these two scholars, networked media is changing celebrity culture, how celebrities are produced and how celebrity is practiced that is celebrity management. Therefore, celebrity exits the realm of media text and branches into a variety of cultural formations. Celebrities play a, fu a social function. They represent an important frame of reference for cultural research. During the years of our activity as Inc, Italian Research Network in Celebrity Culture, we have concentrated on this frame of reference. We have explored a variety of realms of celebrity influence. 
the Italian Research Network in Celebrity Culture has organized a few conferences focusing on the role of celebrities within cultural industries, their interaction with the fashion world, how they, have, they are molded by digital culture, or they represent a changing culture of aging. We have also engaged with specific pop icons like David Bowie. That is, as uh, Roland Barthes says, with new, the new myth of today. Back to our current focus. Today, we would like to investigate celebrities' impact on critical events and on the concept of crisis. We would like to question which spheres of cultural life are involved besides the show business. For example, politics and cultural institutions or social movements. Our first keynote speaker, Cornel Sandvos, addresses the theme of populism in the political arena, tackling the notion of fanization of audiences. Tomorrow, Suzanne Ferris will examine the representation of celebrity in crisis within Hollywood's imagination and Hollywood as a milieu producing celebrities. On Friday, Eugenia Paolicelli will deal with celebrities belonging to minoritarian groups and how they negotiate their power between racialized communities and the fashion industries. As you might have seen scrolling the program, the conference is organized so as to conflate diverse disciplinary realms inside each panel. We are delighted that we have received so many proposals. 42 contributors will tackle the topic of celebrity and crisis from a variety of perspectives. So we have charted a number of thematic areas, eight panels, also two macro phenomena can be outlined. That of the celebrities who have raised to notoriety in situations of crisis, and that of the celebrities who are, who are already famous and have changed their behavior during crisis. Panel one focuses on political personalities turned into celebrities because of an emergency. It deals with strategies of visibility and use of good or bad reputation. Panel two draws study cases of celebrities transformations at difficult stages of their career or of their life. It deals with the insurgence of celebrity phenomena connected to a particular cultural crisis or cultural change or a change of perspective. Panel three deals with behaviors of fans and celebrities during the COVID related emergency. An insight in the evolution of the cultures of celebrity is put to the foreground from online self-narratives to collective discourses about temporary heroes such as sanitary forces. Panel 4 tackles in a variety of ways the public arena concerned with environmental emergency, ecology and philanthropy in emergency territories. Panel five will engage celebrity and stars in the specific realm of film and television with a focus on COVID-19 pandemic. Some of the contributors belong to a research group national project on actors in Italy. Panel six includes a variety of perspectives on the topic of identity crisis and body politics there to relate it. This is a panel that contributes to project Women's Studies Perspective onto the realm of pop music, cultural politics, and social media. Panel seven, social media and consumer culture are the center of this panel, which addresses the issues of temporal span, resilience, and transformation. Panel eight, in panel eight, celebrities' involvement in fashion is analyzed according to how it entangles 
with sustainability, social inequalities, and anxiety. So uh, this was our uh, introduction. And so I think that we can um, immediately go on with the first uh, keynote speaking with the Cornel Sandvos and his discussion, the Donatella campus, that I want to uh, thank again for being here, both of them for being here with us. Donatella, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. And um, I'm very happy and very honored to be here and to introduce, uh, introduce uh, to you uh, Professor Cornel Sandvos. Professor Sandvos is a professor of media and com communication at the University of Huddersfield in UK. And uh, he is really a, a true expert of the phenomenon of fandom. Uh, his work is well known for, uh, for, for this special focus on fandom as a form of participatory culture. And uh, in my views, I think uh, the trademark of his work is the focus on uh, the individual experience of fans. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, this experience can be regarded as an experience of consumption. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of his more well-known well um, one of his well-known book uh, is, is entitled Fans, the Mirror of Consumption. And uh, let me mention also another book uh, uh, co-authored, uh, co-edited with Jonathan Gray and Lee Arrington entitled Fandom, Identi Identities and Communities in a Mediated World. And Professor Sandvos really worked uh, and made research on uh, different areas uh, of human life, of fandom in different areas of human life, in particular sports and politics. But uh, today we will focus uh, on politics because the core of the speech is going to give us uh, is uh, uh, on political fandom. Uh, he worked on many examples uh, on, uh, on political fandom in America, uh, in, in United States and uh, in UK. But today we will focus especially on the case of uh, Jeremy Corbyn and uh, his speech is entitled Fanization and Populism the role of Jeremy Corbyn fandom in the UK 2019 general election. So thank you very much for being here, Cornell, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Donatella, and thank you very much for, again to the organizing committee and Antonella in particular for the invitation. It's much appreciated and it's great to be with you today. Let me share my screen quickly. Um, yes, as I... As, as Donatella just said, the focus on this particular talk is um, based on empirical work which we completed during 2019 and 2020. So it's, it's quite a specific regional case study, but I'll try and draw out some wider conclusions. So what I'm interested in looking at today is in the first instance to explore again the degree in which both the concepts and methodologies of studying celebrities and fans and that relationship between fans and celebrities and popular culture help us understand aspects of contemporary political communication and participation. And you'll quite quickly see in what I'm saying is that I'm going with quite a wide definition of crisis here, one that involves the pandemic specifically in the latter part of the talk, but one that starts with the assumption of a type of crisis of democracy, which we have been seeing particularly throughout the 2010s with the rise of populist governments, um, really around the globe from the Philippines via Brazil to um, the United States and, and many parts of uh, Europe, Eastern, Southern and, and Western Europe indeed. Uh, and of course, those, that crisis then has come to interact with the COVID crisis we are witnessing at the moment as we see in mortality rates um, during the Trump administration under, and in, in, in Brazil and indeed in the United Kingdom uh, under the leadership of Boris Johnson as well. And then secondly, I want to analyze the relationship between, um, as I said, between between fans and crisis, uh, between fan-like affiliations and politics and this unfolding crisis in democracy generally and the COVID crisis specifically in the second part. So I'll tell you a little bit about Jeremy Corbyn because it's quite a specific example. So Jeremy Corbyn was elected 
as leader of the then opposition Labour Party in 2015. Uh, Britain still oper or the United Kingdom still operates under a first past the post system. So that means similar to the US political context, we have two large uh, political, generally two large political parties in the British parts of the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland has got a different political structure and they tend to be the Conservative Party. Um, then under the leadership when he was first elected of uh, Theresa May, no, sorry, actually that's, that's wrong, under the leadership of um, David Cameron, who following his election victory in 2015 um, called for the Brexit referendum. Um, and then Corbyn remained the Labour leader until last year, so um, led Labour into the Brexit referendum in 2016, the subsequent general election in 2017, and then yet another general election that was called in 2019. And our research focuses on uh, that particular period before the general election in December 2019, gener uh, and then following a second wave after the conclusion of the general election in January 2020, and then the third wave during in the um, sort of towards the tail end of the first wave of the COVID crisis in the United Kingdom in July 2020. So the, the view from these islands is that we've been in, in quite a solid crisis for the last five years. So this is why I'm very much expanding um, the notion of crisis here. What we did is we, we uh, undertook 40, um, so this was a study that included 48 participants. Um, and as I said, we revisited them three times and overall this became then a, a three, uh, eight month long, long study, which focused largely on this particular area, which I'll be zooming in now, um, which are parts of Yorkshire, Nottinghamshire and uh, the greater Manchester area, partly for um, regional convenience. So if you look closely, no, I didn't know where Huddersfield was before I first um, came for a job interview here. So that's um, Bradford, Halifax, here we are. That's Huddersfield in the middle. Um, but the main reason for this being is that it's, as you can see here, quite a diverse area. It's quite diverse politically. It's got rural um, areas as much as, as uh, some of the UK's largest city in the form of of Leeds, Manchester, Sheffield, Nottingham. Um, and at the same time, it's very socio-demographically diverse. So in terms of indices of multiple deprivation, um, we find some of the most deprived areas in the UK very close to some in the top 10%. So it's, it, was a, it was a useful space for us to, to undertake this research. And as you can see, um, at least after the 2019 election, this turned out to be a, a kind of politically mixed area, although normally most of these would be, if you follow kind of discourse in the British press, you might have heard the, the phrase red wall seats, which no one really talked about before 2017, but that would have been part of the traditional red wall, in other words, constituencies that would have voted Labour in the past. We under, then undertook a thematic analysis. I won't dive into all of these. Uh, and as you'll see in the talk, there's much scope to some extent over depth today already. I just wanted to flag those kind of three key areas that emerged from our analysis up. Um, they're around the affective bond between the politician as a type of celebrity and fan object and the fan. It's about how that bond is maintained through reading and, and uh, through reading strategies and strategies of reception. And then thirdly, about the relationship between fan object and that's what ar what's around it, the notion of anti-fandom, which I'll come to in the later part of the talk. So before I talk about the case of um, Jeremy Corbyn as a celebrity and its fans during crisis specifically, I want to um, explore a few premises and definitions to that argument. The first one is really to start with what we or how we conceptualize fans and how we think about fans. So Lee, Lee Harrington, Jonathan Gray and I um, suggested in 20, 2007, four, three waves and then in 2017 we had revised that to four waves of fan studies. But the important starting point is that when fan studies started as a field evolving out of British cultural studies, uh, in particular through the work of John Fisk and others, it was very much a political project as much as a research project. And it was very, was very much 
trying to understand forms of media reception and media use, as you know, as something, as a, as a form of empowerment, as an important tactic um, in which media audiences were interacting with media industries. And therefore, this was almost a normative definition by which made a fan the, pe the people who would adopt a, a reading that in one way or another was subversive of resisting existing power structures. What I think we have tried to do since, and what I tried to do specifically um, over the last sort of 15, 20 years is to move to a kind of more empirical definition that is understands that phenomenon more broadly. Um, so at the point when each American, or I, I don't really know about Donald Trump, but uh, previously to Donald Trump, the last few American presidents all tried to emphasize their own fandom of something as part of their political brand. George W. Bush as the former tech uh, um, owner of the Texas Ranger baseball teams, team, or Barack Obama, who was keen to stress his interest in basketball. So at the point where selling yourself as a fan becomes part of a political brand identity, it no longer seemed particularly useful to think about being a fan as something that's inherently subversive or works against power structures. So instead, I want to, or I have described fandom as a form of regular, emotionally involved consumption of a given popular narrative or text or book, television show, or any type of media content, really. And if I was to rewrite this, I would probably call it engagement rather than consumption at this pay stage. So what followed from this was broadening out, as Donatella just said, the scope of what fan studies tries to understand and what type of celebrities and what type of relationship between fans and audiences we are looking at. So to go to, for example, focus explicitly on celebrity, which interestingly is a field that it was largely bypassed in early fan studies, which was very keen to focus on particular types of, of televisual texts and scripted text. Sports is one of those where, of course, there's always a more uncomfortable power dynamic, music, literature, and arts, and then finally politics. And in all of these, I think the interplay between fan and fan object has certain parallels that are important and worth exploring. So the second conceptual assumption that follows on from that is that we are now actually part of a process that I've described as fanization. And I, I apologize for, for yet adding another ization word to the many processes we are trying to look at in, in communication studies. Um, and it, this, it does describe something that mediatization in some parts described, but I'll talk a little bit to the difference. So by fanization, I mean the increasing pre prevalence of fan-like modes of regular effective engagements, which shape media use and rece reception, and that are both structure and structured, that by structure and are structured by our identities and by our community memberships. And there are, as I say, common vectors here to the process of mediatization, or as Andreas Hepp describes it as deep mediatization in terms of it builds on the increasing omnipotence of, of media. It draws on forms of datafication and personalization that is, of course, important for, to it. To some extent, fanization, I would suggest, is the result of a technological infrastructure that more and more co-opts the media user into making active choices in seeking out media content rather than being able to um, kind of being presented with a menu of media content. Um, and then finally, also with going back a little bit, I'm sorry, going back to more than 20 or half a century, quarter of a century now, to John B. Thompson's notion of mediated quasi interaction, which were, of course has been important in our understanding of the rise of um, celebrity, and which Thompson himself recently, in in the contribution to theory, culture, and society. Um, contextualized by adding a final dimension or an additional dimension to it, reflecting the process of mediatization, which he calls mediated online interaction. But this kind of stretched out 
um, notion of mediated quasi interaction, which becomes monological and one to many, which is sort of the, the foundation of many fan celebrity relationships we see, of course, continues in this mediated online interaction to some extent as well. But beyond those technological parallels, there are also differences um, in the social, cultural, and in fairness, economic framing to fanization versus mediatization. I think what's really important to understand the process of fanization are the large social trans and cultural transformations that have happened over in the post-war period, really. Um, and they have changed the way in which we construct and also articulate our identities to others. And the, the three areas, and they're not exclusive, but the three areas I would want to focus on are around work and the work of David Harvey, of course, describes all those transformations in, in great detail, the shift from Fordism to post Fordism, increasingly ephemeral employment, the gig economy, of course, is very much part of that. Increasing geographical mobility and the rise of, for example, diasporas, which also questions and problematizes collective identities. Part of that is, of course, also the emergence of supranational identity in, for example, the form of the, the European Union, uh, as well as the reemergence of, of stronger regional identities. Um, and then the, the fundamental transformations in and around kinship, social relationships, marriage that have been described by both um, Anthony Giddens and, and Beck and Gernsheim, but also many, many other scholars as well. So those are kind of three examples of, of key markers of identity and key spaces against which identity has been historically constructed being subject to change and to some extent needing to be filled with other fixed points in media users and citizens' lives. And what I would suggest is that fan cultures or well, media landscapes have offered some of these fixed points. We find them in particular in sports, for example, right? So where, where sports fandom often um, continues throughout a lifetime from early, from early childhood years until, until the very light stages. One of my, my PhD students, Joseph Smith, um, focused on in his doctorate precisely on this, how people kind of re their life through their fan-like or through their fa sports fandom when they reach their 70s and 80s and their, their final 90s and their final life stages. Um, so broadly, this context of declining fixed points of identity are part of the process that Sigmund Baumann described as the rise of liquid modernity and liquid life. And I think this is quite important because in this sense, being a fan itself is rooted in an, in an element of precarity and an element of precarity that I think we can also describe as a, as a crisis or at least a crisis to some as Baumann goes on to explain. As he, as he, as he wrote in, in Liquid Life, the greatest chances of winning belong to the people who circulate close to the top of the global power pyramid, to whom space matters little and distance is not a bother. Those on the receiving end of the new planetary mobility don't have such freedom. At both ends, the hierarchy um, of people, uh, at both ends of the hierarchy, people are haunted by the problem of identity. At the top, the problem is to choose the best pattern for the many currently, from the many currently on offer. At the bottom of the pyramid, the problem is to cling fast to soul identity, the soul identity available and hold on to its bits and parts together while fighting back the abrasive forces and eruptive pressures, um, repairing the constantly crumbling walls and digging trenches deeper. So the fact that this, the, the process of fanization already, I think, articulates an important moment of crisis in which we try to restructure our identities and find kind of new position against a new, new symbolic resources against which we can narrate who we are and equal to ourselves as much as others. So that brings me to um, convergence culture as the final consideration before we look at, at the actual empirical data. So the 
convergence culture is commonly understood, particularly in the field of, of participatory culture research, as a largely technological process. The flip side, of course, is that um, content has equally converged on many of those platforms. So we have the rise of, of infotainment, right, and the convergence of genre conventions in the transformation of political coverage. So those of you who occasionally watch um, watch watch English football will find that the setup of the presentation of election results here is one that is actually very reminiscent of um, their major sports program. It's a it's a group of panelists sitting around a table and discussing what's been happening and at the bottom we have kind of the news flashing in. Um, and there are a number of scholars who have focused on the emergence of uh, or the transformation of political coverage, in particular televisual coverage of politics and election campaigns specifically, with an emphasis on liveness, of course, 24 hour news come in here, with an emphasis on spectacle over analysis and with the employment of a game frame. And there's good work done by, by colleagues at, at the University of Cardiff, Cardiff uh, Justin Lewis and Karen Val Jorgensen to name just two and many others. But there, there's a whole group of scholars who have all identified the extent to which political coverage, particularly in the UK and the United States, but also beyond, is focused on who is winning rather than who is saying what and why would they be winning, right? So I think that that kind of sport, if I wanted to add another ization or ication word, the sportification of political coverage already matters in understanding um, the emergence of, of partisanship that, that follows from it. But part of it is, of course, also the emergence of new, um, new types of, of technology and channels and platforms within those technologies, including social media. So this is from an interview with a participant in Manchester um, who, in the course of the interview, it transpires that most of his political coverage was not through traditional newspapers um, or radio or television and not even traditional internet sources, but having subscribed to a Facebook group called Jeremy Corbyn's Dark Meme Stash, who focused kind of various fan art created memes and um, sometimes other articles that were being being reposted. So here he explains to our interviewer um, what this is. So it's a group, Jeremy Corbyn, Stank Mean Stash. It's just class. It's full of pictures. Just, yeah, it's it's brilliant. It's, it's Stash is really funny. And so you followed Jeremy Corbyn, Stank Mean Stash? Yeah, yeah, I followed, also fellow Jeremy Corbyn, yeah. What kind of sort of other things do you follow online in terms, whoops, in terms of politics? Well, I guess politics, actually just two really. I can't think of Jeremy Corbyn, that view based on. So um, he follows the second one called Conservatops, which is similar, but more focused on the conservatives. So really his main coverage are these these memes. And you kind of see here the, the, con, the kind of fan art that's being employed. So there's a mix up or a mashup of a Van Gogh picture with sort of youthful skater art and then kind of reinventing again um, the politician as a type of, of useful um, celebrity reflecting Corbyn's particularly fo particular following, which of course is not reflective of, of Jeremy Corbyn. So those of you who know a little bit more, he's, he's not quite the, the um, sartorially evolved as, as, he's, um, as, he's ex as he is portrayed here. So we are, we are unlikely to see him in skater clothes and vans, et cetera. So there is a certain duality here emerging between popular culture and political culture. So when popular culture, we talk about interpretive community, in, if we think about this in political culture and communication, this might actually be siloization, where we talk about participatory culture in fan studies. Traditionally, we have talked about the grassroots movement. In political communication, we focus on bubbles. In the study of fans, this has been called kind of collective intelligence and fan communities. Um, and what's effective and irrational on our side might be seen as post-truth in political communication research. Um, 
So I want to play through those binaries a little bit more by looking at the fanization of political participation. And I'll start a little bit more broadly before zooming in on um, Jeremy Corbyn fans and support in particular. So here's the relatively seamless transition between One Direction fans at a concert and um, Donald, a Donald Trump rally in, uh, I think, early 20, 2018, some, some time before the pandemic. And it's just to summarize what otherwise would be a much longer and larger argument, but you see, you see in, in, in these pictures already the similarities, the similarities in event type, the similarities of the centrality of the politician or musician as, as, as fan object and the celebrity uh, and the kind of collective publicly performed um, affection that becomes part of, of fans own kind of articulation of their identity. So just as important as kind of the One Direction t-shirts in telling these girls' friends something about who they are and their own ambitions become the same way here the Trump, uh, um, the Trump merchandise is being worn by, by his supporters. And of course, having mentioned sports, what we then saw at the beginning of January was a fairly easy transition into other aspect of, of well, sports fandom in particular and partisan sports fandom, which was the, the form of violence that sometimes or historically has been associated with those areas of most partisan identification in um, the storming of the Capitol in 2005. Of course, Trump doesn't come into a political vacuum, right? And he is a reflection of the rise of the Tea Party since the uh, since since 2009, um, which from the beginning constituted uh, this kind of symbiosis of a user fan movement together with a mass mediated campaign that utilized digital platforms but also local meetups and of course if we think about it this is not terribly different to many other forms of large-scale commercial fandom we see right so if you take for example star wars fandom as one of the larger film franchises that have attracted a large global fan community that is very much industry driven right there is an aspect to astroturfing to many of the fan cultures we like to think of as sort of oppositional and subversive and the same happens here with the tea party it's driven by freedom works by political by large donors such as the koch brothers um, but at the same time, it does develop kind of grass move traction and um, leading to, to the, the um, kind of scenario that Scotch Paul and Williamson describe as follow. One of the most important consequences of the widespread Tea Party agitation unleashed from the start of Obama's presidency was the populist boost given to professionally run and opulent ref opulently refunded right wing um, advocacy organization. So, and here they describe along the various operatives that were involved in this, the Republican Party, the Tea Party, working with the Tea Party, Freedom Works, I managed this together. And they managed to create kind of, to push longstanding ideas through what was turned nevertheless into kind of a lift example of the type of participatory culture that, um, someone like Henry Jenkins had described in his work on fan cultures, right? So we've got here emergent of distinct communicative spaces of regular emotive engagement with a given text or object. Um, much of this fandom, of course, centering around particular media texts such as Fox News and a political movement as a kind of anti-fan culture in reaction to something. And I'm not the first person to pick, pick up on this, uh, the aforementioned Graham Turner did, James Hay did, Nick Coldry did, and they kind of came together in a in a um, special collection of um, it was an a of I forgot the journal now. Forgive me. I'll tell you in the end. I think it was uh, cultural cultural studies. Um, 
and left Henry Jenkins quite bruised with their critique, right? And then Jenkins replied that there's nothing about participatory culture that would inevitably lead to progressive outcomes, even if we do succeed in broadening cultural and political participation. And that his point really was that access to platforms and practices through which future struggles of equality and justice will take place. In, I, I want to go one step further here and actually say that Jenkins is probably wrong in suggesting that it might not be per se progressive, but it's kind of a neutral form of participation and actually think about whether these types of uh, participatory culture, particularly in politics, are actually inherently regressive. And if they actually inherently bear the potential to give rise to particular types of political movements over others and in particular popular ones. So kind of in the tradition of here, the third wave of identity, belonging and community, I really want to bring, by, bring together the community aspect of um, fan culture with which Jenkins and others in the first wave tradition have focused on so much with the greater emphasis on looking at aspects of personalization, um, that have emerged in the particular context of, of digital, um, digital technologies. So all of this leads me to the question I want to answer today, which is how does fanization of politics impacts on political discourse and participation, in particular on political discourse and particip participation during the crisis? So let's start doing that by looking at Jeremy Corbyn as a celebrity. So in many ways, Corbyn was an unlikely choice as Labour leader in 2015, and he was generally not expected to be elected. He was not expected to be nominated in the first instance. It was kind of you, um, leaders for the Labour Party have to be nominated by sitting members of parliament. He only won nomination because one or two um, um, MPs lent him his vote because they felt it was important that the width of the party was be, um, represented in the in the forthcoming leadership election, but then members actually, contrary to what had been anticipated, decided to go with Corbyn, who had been a backbencher for um, his entire political life, which which um, lasted at that point um, almost forty years. But quickly, there's a type of effective bond that forms between himself and fans. So there's a Glastonbury appearance where he's got a large crowd of, of young festival goers singing uh, for him and, and or chanting and cheering. Um, and that really is kind of the, he quickly is turned into a very unlikely celebrity. And this is kind of the so it's the flip side of the celebrity becoming politically active, but the the backbench politician being turned into a celebrity celebrity almost in it inadvertently. Um, but the bond then, of course, that emerges between fans and uh, the political celebrity or the politician, or broadly speaking, the fan object, is based on particular ways in which that text is read, right, on the reception, um, and how that fan, and then the question becomes very much about how that fan object is, is um, shaped. What I want to suggest is that generally in, in, in types of fanization and in, in fan-like forms of reception, the text is what Wolfgang Isa would have called instantly normalized. So the important, uh, the the capacity of the fan text to be something that immediately speaks to the particular identity position, to the particular experiences of the fan, is what makes it emotionally and effectively significant. So if we, and of course we never do this because it's it's partly nonsense and I happily admit that, but if we imagine kind of the continuum between text and reader at one where at the one end, the text is has a single meaning, which of course, as we learned from Better Echo and probably knew before that it never has. And then the other end, it's got an infinite number of meanings, which of course it, it also is physically impossible. That still leaves us this very long spectrum in the middle of polysemy 
What is important, I think, is that fan texts tend to be very polysemic rather than just a little bit polysemic, but that fan texts allow for a multitude of different readings and to some extent, therefore, can be very much instantly normalized and they tell us much more about the reader than they actually tell us about the text. And that's kind of what I what I find or what I've found and colleagues have found in almost any area of fandom. When you talk to football fans and you ask them to talk about their favorite team, they very quickly talk about themselves, right? They By talking about what they think the team stands for, what, it, what its tradition is, what its history, they emphasize those aspects and sometimes construct the aspects that they think that really matter. And something very similar happened when we talked to um, to those politically interested supporting a particular a particular politician such as Jeremy Corbyn. Here is Alan who, um, and I've mentioned the constituencies and brackets, so he's in Manchester Gorton in a city, fairly let's say Labour seat. Um, and Alan says, I think in my eyes, Jeremy Corbyn stands for something different, something that I feel has been lacking from politics for a long time. He stands for equality and fairness and democracy and yeah, things like that. He doesn't strike me as a career politician. There's an interesting element of performed authenticity here, right? Because Jeremy Corbyn has literally never been anything else but a politician. It's it's the only type of job he's ever had. He's as I said, he he was been in parliament for for over 40 years, but he is perceived as an outsider and therefore something that's attractive here to the particular fan. Um and those kind of um, readings very much then 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 varied as well. So uh, Alan goes on to carry on to describe a little bit more how he became interested in him during the leadership campaign, and then describes talks about himself a little bit later. So he says, "I have a slightly mm, slightly more confrontational attitude. I guess due to my privilege of being white and male and tall and able-bodied." that I, I don't shy away from confrontations, sort of like, especially when I'm cycling, because I'm, as I'm sure as you're aware, used to, I'm used to the dreadful nature of drivers in Manchester and Britain and the state of the road. So I almost see this as a bit of a, almost some kind of, and he laughs and then, or doing something or saying something. So he's waiting for that. Um, but surprisingly, I've only had, more positive, friendly, polite beeps in support rather than I had people trying to knock me off my bike because I've got a labor badge attached to my back. But he is talking about himself, right? As someone who actually on all counts of intersectionality is very much privileged, but he kind of tries to then play this role for other people. And whom does he support? Someone whom he sees as someone who's also a white may, uh, or older male, who's a politician, but who kind of does exactly the same thing. So there's a type of sort of self-reflective bond that is forming here between Alan and um, his reading of, of Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn. So there is a, this, the fan object, the celebrity here serves as a space for the articulation of, of Alan's own identity. And it's this point that in the past I've suggested that that fandom has this sort of inherently narcissistic function, but in the traditional understanding of the Narcissus myth in which the fascination is, it's not self-love, but it's this fascination with seeing ourselves in the other symbolic form and not quite recognizing that what we really like about this is ourselves, right? So that's why the football club become so meaningful because it's actually part of ourselves that we have invested in it through our reception and through our reading of the fan object and the same thing political fans do as well but this comes at a price which I'll come to shortly um so similarly Charlotte who is herself working class who describes him as mm, he is for, for the working classes, which I guess is me. So again, it's something kind of claiming a type of symbolic ownership here. And these kind of instant strategies of normalizations, I think are very important to understanding how the bond is formed, but also it comes with at the same time, delineating the fan object and the celebrity we have an effective investment in from others. So it's also at the same time about the construction of otherness that becomes important. Um, so this happens through particular strategies. The one thing I want to emphasize here quickly, and I'll, I'll hurry up a bit, 
is to that it's not just about how we read media content, but it's how we select media content in the first instance, right? So here is Alan describing how he becomes first interested in Jeremy Corbyn. And he says he's doing a little bit more digging and reading. And that's where he finds out he's not that dinosaur. Um, and this is at a point point where he is actually disillusioned with the Labour Party votes for the Greens, but actually he would always say his dislike of the Conservatives is more important than his support of the Green Party. And then through that process of looking at different texts, he quickly becomes aware of championing his, his own, um, or that, that Corbyn, he thinks, stands for similar values as he does. So there are three themes here. So political fandom is built on selection. So he does a little bit more reading. Um, political fandom is also a form of anti-fandom. He dislikes the Tories. And then thirdly, that this is already formed in a context of perceived crisis, right? Um, him being nervous about the direction of the Labour Party in 2015, him feeling there's an anti-immigration climate in the UK that he doesn't like, and the Labour Party he doesn't want to be involved with. What's important at this point, and I'll make the last um, go through the last few section in in the next five minutes, and then move to Donatella, is that we need to break fans down a little bit because just a celebrity fan is a very broad category. Here's the typology that that. Um, Abercrombie and Longhurst suggest, and that still works very well to over 20 years later. So they distinguish between the object, the media, and the organization, and they kind of have three shades of fandom. Ignore the labels, they're not very good, but otherwise they're very useful. I'll just illustrate them by running diagonally. So the fan object, um, here is Jack from Ashton under Lyme, who describes how in the 19th, in the mid 1990s, late 1990s, he gets into labor and it's almost part of an engagement in different forms of popular culture. He likes Oasis. Uh, those of you who are of my generation will, will remember that, that part of Britpop. Um, but he's also a, a football fan. He doesn't quite like the Oasis as City fans, but it's okay. And it all sort of goes with the cool Britannia vibe of the first Blair term. Um, and that's how this is positioned. So it's much broader. It's more about labor support. Then the cultus is more specific, right? So here's Liam, also from Manchester, who says, he looks at the Guardian major newspaper, but if the news is looking bad, I try to go somewhere more left wing uh, to more left-wing sources to cheer me up. So he reads specifically HuffPost UK or even more specifically the Canary, which is sort of a user-based website to find the political news he's looking for. And that's what we quickly find is media ecology that emerges around Corbyn with Novara Media, Squawk Box, Momentum web pages, the Canary to, to build that. Um, and I'll jump a little bit ahead here, but what this leads to is really that that media users and fans start constructing their own textual boundaries, right, between this multiplicity of paratext, which allows for this self-reflective relationship. And then in the end, we have got the, the fans who become active themselves. And here's Alan, who ends up campaigning in all of these seats during the election campaign every weekend for six weeks. I should say that almost all of these were labor losses. So in hindsight, he put a lot of work into what was very little, little outcome. Two last points to make. The first one is that actually this is embedded then, as I say, in also the construction against the other. Here's Max who describes that really a lot of this comes down that he likes Corbyn because he hates the Tories and he's sort of seen as the clearest counterpoint. And this otherness is very much embedded in a number of interviewees here. Again, Ali saying whom she hates most is centrist, right? Something we find in a lot of discourses on populism, that the hate is not so much towards the opposite end of the political spectrum, but it's to the people in the middle who try to defend kind of a more liberal democracy. So we've got this construction of others, of Tories, centrists, Blairites, but also, and that's the point I want to finish on, it bleeds into, um, a populism, right, in which which is always based on, as, as Stanley reminds us, on this antagonistic relationship between the populace and the perceived elite and the others. And then it also, and this is part of the campaign, right? If you see here, this is in 2019 for the many, but in yet even bigger letters, we have who it's not for, who it's against, right? The few, 
the assumed 1%. And this then leads to a moment of crisis as well. And that's what I want to finish on. So in many ways, these forms of political fandom are all born out of a moment of crisis. Obama fandom is a reaction against uh, Bush's neoconservatism and invasion of Iraq. The Tea Party and Trump are a reaction, reaction against Obama. Brexit is a reaction against austerity and regional decline, even though it's both um, advanced by the same people. And Corbyn fandom is a reaction against the 1%. But in how we rewrite and how fans then move through this other ring, we move kind of from fandom during the crisis, and they're interesting with their questions, I'll come back to that later, two kind of types of responses to the COVID crisis. The first one is in which the acute crisis is experienced as something that just deepens existing partisanship. The other one is that it's a disruption in which those affiliations are reset in which suddenly, oh, the Tories, they didn't do that well, uh, badly. They actually supported me in my wages. So that crisis resets that fan relationship. But I think more importantly, and that's what I will then finish on, is um, how this effective bond diverges into pulled substance and form, the reason for the initial investment and how it's articulated apart. Um, we see this in the illustration here of coming back to Alfie, who thinks that Jeremy Corbyn is a Remainer, that he is some, someone who is in support of being in the EU. A lot of Labour voters and supporters we talked to were emphasising that at the time. He clearly wasn't. And there's sort of a 30 year record of Jeremy Corbyn being a broadly anti-EU politician. Um, but also there is scope to take this further. What in other areas of popular culture we describe or fandom we describe as to formative works becomes conspiracy theories, right? Here is Peter Wake, uh, from Wakefield explaining um, that Corbyn should have tackled those um, uh, uh, allegations of anti-Semitism. But the way he argues this is you have to tackle it because actually the Jews are really influential and they've got a big lobby and you have to be careful what you say. He actually actively puts forward precisely the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory in doing so um, that, that Corbyn is initially charged with. And we've got sort of more drastic articulations of that on Twitter. Um, and forms of sort of Corbyn-like fan art. And then if we if we want to take the broader view and we look at um, what's happening, for example, in the United States, QAnon is clearly an example of a transformative work, right? Where fans, where a fan community takes a text and rewrites it until it meets its own expectations. So at that point, fandom isn't only formed in crisis, but it actually becomes the crisis in itself. Thank you very much. And sorry, I'm borrowed more two, three more minutes of the time than, than I was given. Thank you for your patience, Donatella. No, no, no. You are perfect, perfectly in time, I think. And your speech was extremely rich and very stimulating. I, I would like to spend the whole afternoon with you in discussing it. But of course, we cannot because it's imperative that we, we close at four o'clock. So I would try to be really short uh, and I should say I have so I, I have really many questions but I will skip the methodological question and maybe you will allow me to write you an email just to satisfy my curiosity and I'll try to focus on two main points that could be of, of general interest maybe at least I hope so and um, let me let me start uh, uh, let me focus uh, um, on a point uh, uh, that you actually raised uh, in the final part of your presentation concerning the idea that fandom is a reaction against something. Because you are suggesting in some ways that fandom and anti-fandom are two sides of the same coin in some ways, because uh, anti-fandom is actually being uh, uh, against something and uh, 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 fandom can be a form of being in favor of someone who represents something, something or some ideas, some values that are, uh, are possibly uh, in opposition to some other people or some other ideas. And you actually offered uh, some very convincing example of this, uh, for instance, Obama as uh, uh, supporters of Obama who were against uh, the new conservatorism or uh, supporters of Tea Party and Trump uh, against the 
Obama and so on, more than against a reaction to, hmm, this is actually the point. And I agree, but I, will, I would like to ask you if you think that this is actually the feature of contemporary fandom or if can be a, a different form of fandom even today, because you related this phenomenon to, um, to populism, and I think this is correct because one of the components of populism is uh, uh, antagonism, uh, because there is the just opposition between us and them, uh, the, uh, the people and the establishment. So maybe this is the uh, prominent form of fandom because uh, today there is a huge uh, uh, wave of populism. So it is a matter of contingencies, but fandom can be also be be different and so not related to a reaction because actually I have in mind some example that are that I am not so sure that I can convey conceive as a reaction I think of the fans of Giuseppe Conte in Italy or maybe even Emmanuel Macron in France so this is my first question and then the other is even more general because I have I've always had a uh, some um, some doubts about the typology of fans you presented. So uh, this was in my mind even before. So I, I'm, I'm taking advantage of my position as, as a discussant today to ask you uh, this question. But though this typology, okay, that differentiates uh, uh, different types of fans. Uh, so fa you mentioned fan, cultist, and enthusiast. Uh, corresponds in any case to a, a group of people that we cannot uh, regard as a sort of replacement of the old strong identifiers. And, or there is also a, a, a way of being weak fandoms, uh, like we had in the past weak identifiers. Mm? Uh, so my question basically is, fandom is, can be a matter of a continuum or uh, we can talk about fans uh, just if we look at people that are really active uh, and uh, prone to act of consumption. And by the way, I was curious about uh, what you said before that you today you prefer to use engagement rather than consumption, because maybe I, in my mind, I relate consumption with more passive, uh, with a more passive attitude. But if you talk about engagement, I tend to think that today you look at fans as uh, uh, can I say, uh, the legacy or in any case, the replacement really of strong identifiers. Uh, and so th this is a, a really my general question about this. And uh, I think I can stop here because probably you will spend some time in answering uh, those two questions. But uh, if we have time at the end, uh, we can also answer some questions uh, from the audience. But um, the floor is yours now. Yeah, I'll try and be quick so I leave quite, uh, time for questions for everyone else. On the second point, I mean, I think I absolutely agree. I don't think, and in fairness, Abercrombie and Long has made the same point. It's not a suggestion that that is a very rigid typology and it is just to reflect kind of the continuum that exists. But there is a certain, there are patterns which I think are re-emerging, right? So whether it's 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 music or politics or sports or, or um, art, the, the further you go into sort of the enthusiasm spectrum, the more people's own activity becomes kind of the source of the fandom. And I think in political culture, that's important to understand, um, in particular, if you look at the Corbyn case, why there is such a gap between a really, really committed um, group, inner group around Corbyn. And we see during the Corbyn years, um, we see Labour membership skyrocket. It's, it's the only European major political party that, that significantly grows in membership during that time. But at the same time, its electoral fortunes go exactly the opposite way, right? So, and that's because you have something like an enthusiast and who are very engaged. You have got momentum, which I didn't talk much about. It's a sort of half youth movement, but generally kind of activist network that underpins Corbyn fandom. And which those those people who were momentum followers who we interviewed, they just really didn't understand that they could clearly see that this man was fantastic. And the people who they met on the doorstep step in Altrincham and in Crewe and in Barry South really didn't, right? And I think in that sense, it's useful because I think that whole spectrum still falls under something I want to describe as fanization. So the weak fans in a way 
have some effective bonds as well, right? And I think the one thing I find always interesting about qualitative political um, communication research is how confused people's politics are, right? There are a lot of people who make electoral decisions that aren't quite captured in sort of the quantitative large scale election surveys but which really come out when you talk to them and they don't make any sense, right? It's like people are either what you might see as ill-informed, but that's slightly patronizing, but just kind of have really confused politics. And so even the weak fandom, I think to some extent matters. And for someone like Boris Johnson, it matters tremendously, right? Because the one thing that comes through, even with some of those Labour supporters is the kind of, and that worked with George W. Bush as well, is like, I hear probably a laugh to go down the pub and have a drink with, right? There's sort of a certain connection, an effective connection of like, I don't agree with his politics, but he might be kind of funny and therefore I might actually end up voting for him so even the weak fandom I would argue matters mm -hmm. um sorry your first question with regard to to the reaction against something do you think that today's yeah. fandom can be uh, always a reaction against something or not necessarily no I don't I mean if we I think this one becomes less a question of fandom is generally like this but it develops in certain in certain textual contexts like this, right? So there are um, parts of television fandom, mm. for example, are or literature fandom are much less antagonistic. Uh, music fandom tends to be often less antagonistic. Sports fandom is particularly antagonistic. Unfortunately, I think the, the, the political text is closest to sports in kind of the digital landscape we are, right? So it's, it, this then has also to do with with the media systems in which we operate. It could be absolutely different, but and it's it's not only the media systems I should bring in. It's also about electoral systems. So I think one of the pronounced differences I see between the discourse, for instance, in Germany or to some extent even the Netherlands and what's happening in the UK. Italy is a more tricky case, one one that all of you know much better than me. So I'm not going to go on that thin ice, but. Um, is that it's a different electoral system, right? And the US and the UK electoral system of first past the post creates this antagonism from the beginning, whereas in, in you know, there's more scope for nuances and less antagonistic uh, views in, 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 for, in proportional representative systems. Okay, so we have uh, some, a few minutes for some questions. So if, uh, uh, if you may try on the chat your intention to ask a question, we can give you uh, the voice uh, to do so. Anybody? Well, uh, if there are no questions, so I can uh, expand a bit uh, my last uh, question to you. Ah, okay. No, I don't. Disappear. Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Just a technical question. Uh, did you video record your interviews? And if yes, uh, did you analyze the uh, nonverbal uh, signs uh, of the interviewer? Um, so the, the, the question is, is no. Um, by sort of the, the first two waves were in C2, so we met, we went to participant homes. Uh, yes. And I don't know what your question on method was, Donatella, but precisely because of this spectrum, we worked with also a market recruitment agency because we didn't want the traditional um, ethnographic led approach, which mm -hmm. focuses on fan cultures, which always means you end up centering on the enthusiasm end, right? So we wanted those people who kind of, on the screening question would say, Corbin, that's a 10 out of 10 for me or nine out of 10, but who don't have those social connections and which you don't reach through snowballing. So we went to people's homes, we interviewed them in the first two waves in, in their homes. And then the final wave, because we were in lockdown at that point and because yeah. people had gotten used to computer technology were done via Zoom and they were video recorded, but we didn't, we didn't analyze them for the queue. So we went with, with the transcripts, but um, yeah, I mean, we. so I know about a quarter of the interviews I did myself, but it's generally the research team that did the interviews rather than outsourcing them to, to research assistants. Thank you. 
any, any other question from the audience? Uh, Antonella? Hi, Karna. I'm very Hello. happy to see you <laughs> in some ways. And thank you a lot for your very interesting uh, uh, talk. Uh, I appreciate it a lot. And um, um, just one question, because it was very full of things. So I, I have to process myself many, many topics for your, for your speech. But just one question, because um, in, in my study, I, um, I, I see many times this of diffused fandom. No, like diffused audiences and so on. So um, this way to study um, political fandom is a, a part of this uh, uh, large uh, um, frame connected to diffused fandom. And what do you think about this? Because I think it is really interesting to use the fandom frame also in politics because it is uh, uh, useful for uh, fandom theories more in general. So we can see other aspects connected to fandom. So this is a sort of reflection and also a question. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, I think there is a, there's a clear overlap between kind of the notion of diffused audiences and what I describe here as, as fanization, right? Because I try to capture that this is a broader process in which most of us are co-opted and which just leads to I'm, I'm trying not to make sort of the very predictable Habermasian argument of everything used to be fine and voters thought rationally about who they vote for and now they just sort of go with an identity affiliation that's clearly not the case and it's more complex than that but it is kind of there is an element in which kind of the seeking out content and the uh, partisanship that underscores sort of the wider culture war that's happening in in much of Europe, the US, etc. constantly invites fan-like identifications, right? And it's it's I mean in that sense the, the line between the political and the non-political is very hard to to draw, right? And I think Hartley and and Lisbeth Van Zun and others are right is that, you know, if we look at the major major change a major form of social and cultural progress we have made all of that originates in what Hartley calls the semiosphere right so the, the bits outside the official public sphere in which for example um different forms of of sexual orientation and same-sex partnerships just have become socially acceptable long before that or at least some stage before that then was turned into law and became into the political arena same around sort of an awareness of risk society and the green movement and in parts of what we're looking at in what's happening in germany at the moment where the greens are out polling the christian democrats that's a consequence of you know a lot of things that happen outside politics flowing back in so yeah i think that's really important but at the same time it also does something to politics itself, right? And the people who get elected. And I mean, if I have sort of a question for the audience, which is a little bit around how you feel that is playing, how applicable is this approach to, to the Italian scenario where you kind of clearly had someone like Berlusconi who in many ways sort of very much build a, a celebrity um, personality, but then, <laughs> What what's I'm not sure the the fanization is a very good way of understanding of of sort of the current fragmentation post well, the, the uh, pandemic in Italy. I'll try to to answer your question by saying that uh, I think there are many differences uh, uh, among cases, and then in relation to what you you were saying before uh, in answering my question about antagonism, the point is that all cases you mention. Are cases where, of course, there is a leader, and uh, uh, and people are a f a leader are the fan of that leader. But there are also values and ideas. Yeah, and that's uh, I, I think this is the key point because you can also have a form of uh, of fanization, or in any case, we have uh, some forms of political fandom that uh, maybe are more focused on the personal character of leaders. 
and not so much on values and ideas as well. And so in that sense, you may have less antagonism, but in any case, you have a, a form of engagement. And uh, it, let me ask you a counter question. In the cases you studied, you have the feeling that this bond is stable, that is not um, transient, because my, my perception is that uh, a, an attachment of this sort can be stable uh, even if there are also some values that are involved. And by contrast, if the attachment is with a person just because of the character, just because of the personality, this can be much, much more transient. And so there can be a, an initial enthusiasm, but maybe this, this, does, not last, this does not last for a long time. And I so mean, that's a, that's a separate talk and I, I see we come up to, to four o'clock, but so in the second and in the third wave, it comes through very clearly that a remarkable number of particular defense rather than occultists and enthusiasts move on very quickly, right? They might not be a, now a few months later, but at that point, they're more interested in Starmer or they have kind of moved on from Corbyn after he loses the election. It's, it's the fallacy of fan research, right? So for example, in sports fandom, it's full of, their books full of fans saying they will always support their same team, right? But we know when a team goes down from the first to the third division, they have many fewer supporters. And actually the same happens here as well. So there is this kind of the liquidity that Bauman describes, I think comes in here as well. And some of those fan affiliations are more, are more ephemeral too. No, ju just to, to close my, 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 my observation before, the point is that Italy is a country of uh, several uh, different examples. So you can find <laughs> all the different nuances. That's the point. And I, I totally agree with you. OK, four o'clock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really a very interesting uh, speech. And uh, so I, I think that uh, we can close here. And uh, I, I give the floor to the, the panels that starts before the start two panels at the same time no it, I, I'm not really <laughs> I don't know exactly so I, I, I ask Antonella to replace me now <laughs> with the formation the correct information